But you've got a good idea. It's much easier to push that to wretched excess. Of course, it's always going to be some good idea. Nobody's going to say, I've got some that I want to sell you. Charlie Munger just revealed that he believes the US will likely face either higher inflation or a recession in 2023. The 98-year-old billionaire and business partner to Warren Buffett sat down for an interview with CNBC where he discussed the topic in the title of this video, as well as the current investing landscape, the FTX situation, and a bunch of other things as well. And today, I'm going to be breaking down the most important parts from this interview, including some clips that are not yet on the CNBC YouTube channel yet and that I actually pulled from the full podcast that they did which you can listen to if you want. It's available on Spotify and Apple Music. This video is sponsored by ShareSite, a comprehensive portfolio tracking tool that automatically tracks the performance of your investments so you can say goodbye to Excel spreadsheets forever. Use my referral link in the description below or head directly to ShareSite.com forward slash Hamish Hodder to try ShareSite for free or receive four months of a yearly subscription. I basically like the existence of the Fed. I think in a world of fiat currencies, we need wise central banks. And we've, if you look at Japan today, you would find that the central bank has made our central bank look like a little mouse that hardly tries to do anything. So we've learned that central banks can be really important you can push them to great excess if you have to and you're in enough trouble. Charlie Munger believes that it's important for a country or a region to have a central bank that has some tools available to it in order to at least attempt to, to some extent, bring some economic stability to the financial markets and to the broader economy. And we see that playing out, at least in the US and some other major countries, in the form of either monetary stimulus or monetary tightening, kind of two directions in which the Fed can move uh, in order to bring stability, whether the market is too hot or whether the market needs some kind of uh, artificial boost to get it going again. And at times, the function of the Federal Reserve or other central banks can feel like they are influencing the way that the markets move that they're actually causing the recession to occur by rising int raising interest rates, or that they're actually causing a boom to happen by giving a huge amount of stimulus in the market. In reality, they're not really causing those things to happen, although their actions tend to drive markets and the economy in those directions. In reality, they're actually just reacting to already unstable market conditions. They're supposed to be the one guy at the party that doesn't hang around the bump punch bowl and getting drunk. Although a lot of people say they're the ones who provided the punch bowl. Well, I think that's pushing it. And besides, I think we were in enough trouble when this thing started. If the Fed hadn't done what it did, which was very aggressive, we would have had one hell of a mess, which would have been way worse than what we have now. You're, you're talking about with the COVID lockdowns? I'm glad they were there. I'm glad they did what they did. They did. In 2020, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates to 0% and provided a huge amount of stimulus that ultimately allowed a lot of businesses to stay alive and individuals to receive money from the government while they couldn't work, ultimately saving a huge amount of pain in the economy. And ultimately, it was that excessive stimulus that is playing a role in the higher inflation that we see today. But without acting in 2020, it's almost certain that things would have been far worse. It's really easy to just look at the Fed and say that they are responsible for the inflation that we see today and that if they raise interest rates too quickly, that they will be responsible for the recession. But we can't forget that we've just gone through a once in a century global health crisis. And if the Federal Reserve and other central banks didn't step in and give stimulus to individuals and businesses when they did, then people may have had to continue to work and continue to go out into the world uh, as normal. And that could have led to far more people dying or uh, people would have still been forced to stay indoors and, and not go out as much. And a lot of people would have, a lot more people, I should say, would have lost their life savings or their careers or their businesses. Ultimately, if no stimulus was provided, then the damage would have been absolutely catastrophic. And the unfortunate reality is that in a lot of places around the world where they don't have a strong democratic government system with a central bank attached to it uh, and a strong financial system, 
ultimately the pandemic was catastrophic for a lot of places. And unfortunately, there just cannot be a net positive from the pandemic, especially in terms of economics. And ultimately the Fed can just do their best to mitigate the damage and to keep the economy moving forward. We haven't had to try it, but if we get in the kind of trouble Japan was in, of course we'll do the same damn thing. Do you worry about the Fed creating a recession by slamming on the brakes too hard? Well, I think the Fed is willing to have a little recession in order not to have out of control inflation. That's what they're supposed to do. In the current environment, Munger believes that the Federal Reserve is willing to send the US into recession if that's what's necessary in order to bring inflation under control or at least prevent it from continuing to spiral. And the reason for that is because even though this inflation crisis is primarily being driven by supply chain issues, those supply side issues are still not resolving themselves 18 months later. And there's you know a number of reasons for that that I'm not gonna get into in this video, but when supply side issues can't resolve themselves, then the best available tool that we know or that the Federal Reserve has in order to get inflation under control is to bring down demand and they can do that by raising interest rates, which is exactly what they've been doing. And unfortunately, when you have to raise interest rates a lot and bring demand down significantly, it's very likely that a recession plays a role or plays a part in that equation. Nobody wants a recession, of course, but it's far better than letting inflation spiral out of control and then having to, well, essentially kicking the can down the road and then eventually having to cause an even worse recession or depression. Do you think that's the case with this? Is this the beginning of a, a larger unraveling? That's another subject. A very famous man once said that a great civilization has a lot of ruin in it. And it took a long time to ruin it. Rome took a long time to decline from its peak to its bottom. And that will be true with other civilizations that have come along later. But these people that are promoting things like Ben Con they're promoting the decline of civilization. Munger isn't super clear about this question when he's asked about whether things are going to spiral out of control. But essentially, what I gauge from his answer is that he doesn't really know for sure, as, as really nobody does, as to whether a recession or a depression is coming. But these bubbles in, in cryptocurrency and in other parts of the financial markets certainly contribute to the likelihood of things becoming very, very bad. And Charlie did comment specifically on the FTX situation, as well as his deeper thoughts on the cryptocurrency space and how he sees it playing out. But you've got a good idea. It's much easier to push that to wretched excess. That's why good ideas carried to wretched excess become bad ideas. And once you've got that concept in your mind, of course, it's always going to be some good idea. Nobody's going to say, I've got some that I want to sell you. <laughs> yeah, <that's from> blockchain. Hi, <laughs> I'm saying blockchain. The reason why a lot of what you would consider rational or logical human beings get swept up in these bubbles and these euphoria is because at its core, there's often a very, very good technology or some kind of innovation that does have true value at the core of what then becomes a bubble. In this case, we're talking about blockchain technology, which is the foundation of which these cryptocurrencies uh, run and function. And there are probably many ways in which businesses in the future will use blockchain and decentralized uh, networks uh, in order to provide value in, in, in some way, whether it's in finance, finance specifically uh, or whether it's in some other area as well. But unfortunately, these new technologies, these new innovations also create new markets which are not properly regulated and that drives people to uh, often act in either deluded or fraudulent ways. A lot of uh, delusion. It's, it's partly fraud and partly delusion. That's a bad combination. I don't like either fraud or delusion. And the delusion may be more extreme than the fraud. Charlie Munger sees the FTX and broader cryptocurrency space as a combination of fraud and delusion. There are people who are purposefully deceiving investors for their own financial gain, creating scam coins and all of this other stuff. 
But then there's just a lot of people who have a fundamental misunderstanding of how cryptocurrency actually fits into the broader investing space. And what Munger is talking about is essentially the illusion that cryptocurrency actually creates wealth. Well, nobody's going to be a new thing that every 12 year old kid can be a billionaire or something. He just calls it Munger coin. He starts trading it or something. It's, it's, a, it's crazy. It's demented. Cryptocurrency is a non-productive asset, which makes its investment outcome what's called a zero-sum game. Zero-sum is a situation where one person's gain is equivalent to another's loss, so the net change in wealth or benefit is zero. Of course, this doesn't apply to every single individual transaction in the cryptocurrency space. There can be transactions where both the buyer and the seller of the cryptocurrency in that exchange end up benefiting. But since the cryptocurrencies don't actually do anything, they don't actually produce any income or cash flow, then the value of the entire crypto space overall cannot possibly exceed the amount of money that people put into it. Or in other words, there's no wealth actually being created in the crypto space. It's just being moved around from one person to the other. And you might think, well, how is the stock market any different? Isn't it the exact same thing? You're still just trading shares in the same way you're trading cryptocurrencies. And it's not. The stock market is not a zero-sum game. While yes, if you're trading or speculating on the performance of share prices in the short term, then it could be a zero-sum game. But overall, again, if we zoom out and look at the entire stock market and you take all of the investment dollars going into businesses, they're actually going towards productive assets. They're going towards businesses that uh, produce products and services that create jobs and create more income that then can then be used to invest into more businesses, into other assets and other ventures. Or to understand it at a more simple one-to-one -one kind of level, if uh, you buy a stock from somebody else, they get the money they may benefit from, from the transaction. You don't actually have to sell that business in order to make money. Unlike cryptocurrency, in cryptocurrency, you have to sell it to somebody else in order to make a return on that investment. Whereas if you own a business, whether it's a share in a business or the entire business, you don't technically have to sell it to somebody else. You could just run the business and reap the benefits of the machine that you've bought that has employees and systems and and uh, other assets that allow it to produce profit for you. I don't like wretched excess and manias and so forth. And we have a lot of it. And you're never going to get rid as long as you have liquid securities markets. Excessive optimism and pessimism are just natural parts of highly liquid markets. Uh, humans are emotional beings. Um, we like to think that we're rational and we try and act rational, you know, over time, but we're emotional beings. And even when it comes to things such as finance, where uh, we... We rationally know that uh, emotion pl shouldn't play a role in financial decisions, that it should be purely, you know, mathematical, scientific, that kind of thing. Even though that's the case, uh, our financial decisions and outcomes impact us emotionally. They impact our family. They impact our relationships, our well-being. So without, you know, consciously maybe being aware of it, or hopefully we are aware of it, uh, emotions are going to play a role in our investment decisions. And that drives people to become overly optimistic about outcomes and overly pessimistic about other outcomes. And that ultimately drives the oscillations of euphoria and pessimism in the markets. And even though it can feel scary at times, if you're a value investor, having markets that move from optimism to pessimism is actually a really good thing because it essentially means you have the opportunity to invest in really high quality businesses when people are being overly pessimistic about them and when their prices are far lower than their true value to you. If you're interested in seeing the checklist that I go through before I invest in companies, it's always linked down in the description below along with all of the other resources that are available on my website. But with that said, hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one.